All right, um, you guys are going to start a new project in here, and it is going to be about spoken word poetry. But before we get into spoken word poetry and the process that you're going to use to do that, we're going to do this little writing workshop that is going to significantly improve your writing in a very short amount of time. Uh, this guy's name is Peter Nevland. He is a spoken word poet and a writer. Um, he's actually in, um, he lives in Austin, Texas. Uh, he came to a church I was attending about, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago and did this same writing workshop there. And he teaches people that are anywhere from first, second, third grade, all the way to grown adult writers. Um, he's got some very easy things that you can do that are going to improve your writing. And what I'm going to have you do is I will be stopping this from time to time so that you can take notes and write things down. There's going to be some really important things to write down. Um, like I said, today it was all right with me if you use paper because when you're done, I'm going to have you either give it to me and I'll scan it in and send you a scan of your notes. Uh, because this is writing and I don't have a problem with you actually doing some physical writing today. You may also take notes on a Word document if that's what you choose to do. All right, we're going to start this video right here. You've been exposed to writing just about your entire life, but rarely, if ever, has anyone taught you how to write, how to electrify your words and make them spring to life. Well, I'm Peter Nevlin, and I'm going to teach you how to write. This is the first lesson. Now, when I was in Austin, I was in an art gallery opening, and uh, I was outside having some hors d'oeuvres, and all of a sudden this kid, little kid in an oversized adult motorcycle helmet, like runs into my leg, tottering around, and I go, hey, watch out there, buddy. And we made eye contact, and instantly we were like best friends, you know? And so we spent a bunch of time playing with each other, running around outside. And uh, so then uh, I thought, man, what could I possibly say? I know this kid doesn't have a dad. And here's my chance to be a good older brother to him right now. So what can I possibly say that's going to stick with him longer than tonight? That's what I came up with. Sometimes I can see the future. David's four and a half year old eyes open portals to an alternate universe. Really? Yep, not all the time, but sometimes. Wow. Let's race! His little legs bounded off outside, begging me to follow right past his mom, flying around the corner, kicking through muddy grass, selling with horse manure and gravel. I chased after him, 33-year-old heart injected with a time warp elixir made of everything's possible. I'm gonna catch you, I'm gonna catch you. David ducked his head, pumped his fists, and punched it into high gear. I inhaled the same joy of young boy treasure hunt, spring rain puddle stomping, winter snow football tackles as I sped up alongside him, wanting to press my hand at that rusted pickup truck skin first and declare, victory! But remembering that I was an adult trying to beat a four-year-old, <laughs> I don't remember who won. My daddy has a pickup truck, really? Do you get to see him much? Not much, but sometimes. His eyes fell to earth for a second before looking up to see this big male jumping bean still smiling at him with more compassion than before. A flash of excitement erased the melancholy from his face. Oh, come on, let's race! And he took off again back around the corner to where we started. This time, I let him win. You beat me, man, you're so fast. Unfazed, he took off again. Four and a half year old limbs wanting to extend this marathon of older male enjoyment as long as possible. We raced back and forth, faster than any racehorse could run, longer than the endurance of the sun. It's a good thing that I'm in relatively good shape because David wouldn't take no for an answer. Pushed himself to go faster and faster by the time the moon glanced a merciful eye down to our well-worn track. He noticed little legs beginning to wobble. You're getting tired, I yelled mischievously as I chased after a slower pace. When we got back to home base, I said, do you want to look at the art? He grabbed my hand and we trudged inside the Austin figurative gallery. She doesn't have any clothes on. She doesn't have any clothes on. How come she doesn't have any clothes on? Man, I just met this kid and I'm not even in a relationship with his mom and already I get to have the talk with him. People paint people without clothes sometimes because the human body's beautiful, I said, noticing his mother nodding slowly with her eye smile a few yards away. Well, 
She didn't have any clothes on. Come on, let's race again. You can't beat a night of racing for a boy with no full-time dad. Life doesn't get much sweeter than innocent boy-like fun for an unmarried man with no full-time son. When David finally finished his racing, his flying through the night skies, I swung him round in my arms. I knelt down and looked into his happy, tired eyes again. You remember how I told you that sometimes I can see the future? Yeah. Well, one day you're going to grow up to be a man, because that's what little boys do. You're going to have a good relationship with your mom and be thankful for her. And you're going to teach other boys how to be a man just like you. The silence of two seconds lasted like an eternity as a seed of hope took root in a child's vast universe. Can we race one more time, Peter? He asked, conquering what was left of my heart. I stepped through portals into an alternate universe where children's requests can never be denied and the heart of a father always finds time to plant seeds in the soil of growing boys. Sure, I be. Let's race. All right, so let's talk about this piece here for a second. Figure out what exactly you think about it. First of all, I want to ask you, you think it's poetry or do you think it wasn't poetry? Right? All right. Is it poetry or is it not poetry? Write it down. Write it down. Hurry. Is it poetry or is it not poetry? All right, you got your answer? Write down in the no. comments right now whether you thought that piece was poetry or it wasn't poetry. Now, the interesting thing is, is that usually... The people who think it was poetry say the same things as the people who think it wasn't poetry. So nobody really knows, but I know. I have the definitive answer for whether it was poetry or not. You want to hear it? I don't care. Here's what I really care about. Did you like it? All right. Did you like the story or did you not like the story? Did it draw you in or did it not draw you in? Just write it down. It may not have been your favorite story, but did you find yourself being pulled into it and paying attention? Now, if you liked it, tell me you liked it. See, I bet you that almost everybody who watched this liked it, and that is the secret to good writing, is being able to connect with your audience. It's not about what type of writing it is, whether it's an essay, whether it's a poem, whether it's a story or a song. Good writing will make the other person feel what you feel. All right, write down that word connect or connection. That is the important operative word when you're talking about writing or spoken word poetry. You want to connect with someone. What did you like? Think about what you liked about that piece. Was it maybe a kid stomping in puzzles? Anybody ever done that before? Um, me, as an adult? Me, I still do it. Still trying to get my brother wet every time it rains and we're walking next to each other outside somewhere. Anybody ever done this before? Had a race as a kid, right? You can see all this stuff happening in your mind. Anybody gone ever into an art gallery and been like, um, should I be able to look at this? You know, all that awkward feeling that we have, right? We've all experienced this stuff. So I'm tapping into that. And here's the primary way that I'm tapping into that. Look at this uh, little phrase from my piece. David ducked his head, pumped his fists, and punched it into high gear. I inhaled the same joy. What are the words here that make this writing just spring to life, that make the action come to life? All right, what are the important words there? Duck, what jumps out at you? Duck, duck, punch, punch, okay. Why do those words capture your attention? Action. What are they? Action. Action. Actions. Cool. All right, hold on. I need to. I need to be able to pause this. You just click F10. All right. So we said that the words that were important were ducked, pumped, punched, and inhaled. And then we decided that those words are important because they are actions. So let's move on. There you go. Ducked, pumped, punched, inhaled, right? What kind of words are those? They're verbs. They're action verbs. 
And interesting verbs create clear imagery and powerful action. You want to start to be a good writer? Start with your verbs. Take your verbs, take out the boring ones like do and put and make and replace them with words like slice and explode and rip, embrace, all of those different words. All right, write this down. This is important. Interesting verbs create clear imagery and powerful action. Write that down. Interesting verbs create clear imagery and powerful action. Notice how those were some of the words that kind of pulled you into the story. And you'll see even later on, you know, the, the spring rain puddle jumping. It's still an action. Or racing is still an action. They're dangerous. They're exciting. It's a whole new adventure world when you start to use verbs, all right? Now let's look at this. I inhaled the same joy of young boy treasure hunts, spring rain puddle stomping, and winter snow football tackles that I sped up. Now if... All right. What draws you into that right there before he tells you? All right. Well, inhaled. Okay. What else? Stomping. All right. Treasure hunts, puddle stomping, winter snow football tackles. Okay. What do you notice about those? Are they active? They are active, but what else are they? Do you have kind of a clear picture in your head? Spring rain puddle stomping. How many of you have gone to the store or something with your mom or whatever? See, my kids that are grown still do this. If there's a puddle and we're walking through a parking lot, they will get on either side of me, jump in a puddle, and boom. They think it's hysterical. Okay? All right, here we go. We've already talked about the verbs, so what makes this interesting? What are the interesting words, the interesting Pay phrases attention. here? All right, puddle stomping, football tackles, treasure hunts, spring rain, winter snow. That's because these things, you've all either done them before, or you, they've all got shape and they've got color associated with them. We say that a picture is worth a thousand words, but there are some words that are worth a thousand pictures. Okay, this is important. Write it down. A picture is worth a thousand words. We've all heard that expression before. A picture is worth a thousand words. But there are some words worth a thousand pictures. Uh -huh. A picture is worth a thousand words, but there are some words that are worth a thousand pictures. One last time, a picture is worth a thousand words, but there are some words worth a thousand pictures. For instance, what if I say the word shaggy? Huh? Huh? What are you thinking of now? Are you maybe thinking of like a guy that like, you know, has a dog and stuff and like is afraid of ghosts like zoinks, there's ghosts in here, oh, right, there's ghosts right here, let's go, we never do. Right? Okay, you think of all that stuff just by me saying the word shaggy, right? But you know what color his shirt is. You know what color his pants are. You know who he's got with him all the time. You know what they're hungry for. You know what the evil dude says at the end of the episode whenever he gets caught. Oh, if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. All by me just saying one word. See, these are shapes, colors, names of places, things familiar. They create instant imagery. Okay, write that down. Shapes. Colors, names of places, and things familiar create instant imagery. All right, keep in mind that I'm recording this on a screen capture and I will post it on the website so if there are things that you miss because I move on while we're recording this you can go back to the video and get them
shapes, colors, names of places, and things familiar create instant imagery. Because they've got imagination, they've got emotions, they've got memories tied to them. Okay, if I say the word Paris, suddenly the Eiffel Tower springs to life. Maybe French food, French wine, French women, French armpit hair, right? All that stuff pops in your head just by me saying the word Paris. So use these in your writing. Powerful verbs, then use shapes, colors, names of places, things that are familiar to people, and you'll cause your writing to spring to life. People will be giving you standing ovations for it. It's crazy. It works every time. All right? Look at this. Wanting to press my hand to that rusted pickup truck skin first. Okay, what's the one important word rusted. in that whole thing? Rusted. rusted. Why? What does rusted tell you about that truck? It's old. It's old. What else? It's orange. Probably has an orange tint to it because it's rust, right? Okay, so you get a lot of images when you hear that one word, rusted. Now, press, obviously the verbs, so we talked about the verbs, we talked about the nouns. Now, what's the word here that makes this just a little bit more interesting? Rusted, okay? Rusted right there gives us a little bit more definition of that pickup truck. What does it tell you? It tells you the truck's old. Anybody ever bought a new pickup truck that was rusted? If you did, you're an idiot, right? Don't do that. So, rusted pickup truck skin first, right? So the adjective right there, notice it's not a complicated one, but it shaded, it contrasted the meaning for extra definition. All right, adjectives shade or contrast your meaning for extra definition. Uh, beside that last one you wrote about images and things, write the word nouns beside that because you should have written verbs up by the other part. So we've got verbs, then we've got nouns, and now adjectives, the action words at the beginning. What action words? Oh, it is up there. The verb is already up there. Adjectives shade or contrast your meaning for extra definition. And we're going to move on so we can get this done. But remember, you can always come back to this. Yes. It told me that it was old without saying old. That's good writing. When you can tell somebody something without actually saying it to them, ooh, then your writing is starting to get really good. Okay? So let's go on here. Let's look at this piece right here. Wanting to press my hand at that dirty old rusted pickup truck skin first. Dude, dirty, old, rusted? I don't need all those adjectives. See, most people think they've got to add more adjectives in to make it more exciting. That's not necessarily going to make your writing better. Because too many adjectives, they dilute the meaning, they stop imagination, and they bore the listener. Yes. If you use too many adjectives, they dilute the meaning. What does that word dilute mean? If you make lemonade and it's too strong, what do you do to it? Add, water. Add some water, right? You dilute it. You water it down a little bit. So if you use too many adjectives, you take away from the flavor. You dilute the meaning. You stop imagination, and it bores the listener. You're telling them what to think instead of letting them think and imagine for themselves. you want to be a good writer, concentrate on the verbs, concentrate on the nouns, the shapes, the colors, the things that are familiar to people, and then if you need some extra definition, throw in the adjectives. People who depend on their adjectives for their writing are most likely weak writers. Now, when I say, David, grab my hand, and we trudged inside the Austin figurative gallery, what comes next? You remember? Naked people. Now notice, I say, she doesn't have any clothes on. I never actually say the word naked, and yet your brain goes, oh, that equals naked. But that, she doesn't have any clothes on, you didn't expect me to say that. That's dangerous. You don't go there, especially not if you're going to teach a writing workshop for students or something, right? And suddenly I'm talking about naked people. Well, I did that because when you mix familiar images with the unexpected, then you open a door to the world of art. Oh, wait, let me rewind that a little bit. Right here. Mixing familiar images with the unexpected, and if you can, turn your paper over and write that upside down. Or you can flip your words on the screen if you're typing them. Mixing familiar images with the unexpected opens a door to the world of art.
like he said, the little boy was in there, and he was a little bit uncomfortable going, uh, she didn't have any clothes on. He never said the word naked, but that is what pops into your brain. It was unexpected. You're like, oh, I can't believe she's showing that video here. All right, mixing familiar images with the unexpected, but mark that word unexpected somehow. Circle it or underline it or something so you can set it apart. Opens a door to the world of art. And you open a door to the world of art. Ooh, and art shows us worlds we've never seen. Art takes us to worlds that don't exist. Art shows us heroes we've never met. Art shows us heroes in us all. Amazing. Four words. We can do it. And a picture of a normal woman flexing her muscle inspired a whole generation of women to rise up and go to work and support the war effort. The men wouldn't have won the war without the women. The women wouldn't have won without the men. That's the power of art. And you can use that in your writing. See, great artists transform normal, everyday surroundings into works of genius. All right. Great artists transform normal, everyday surroundings into works of genius. Write this down. Great artists transform normal, everyday surroundings into works of genius. I mean when I say that look at this painting right here it's only two colors that are used blue and yellow and yet this is a priceless painting now what does he make bigger than life how does he use those colors what does he use to make bigger than life in the what's bigger than life in those the stars the stars, the stars. yeah because if they were really that big we probably couldn't survive this painting the stars the stars are freaking huge. There's no way that if we ever had stars that were like that in real life, that any of us would be alive anymore. We'd all be burnt to a crisp, okay? But he makes the stars bigger than life because we all wish that they could be that big and could inspire us like that. The light is way brighter than what you actually experience on a reflection across a lake. And that's beautiful. It makes those things spring to life when you do that. So if you want to know, if you want to know how to, to take your own story and to make it come alive in the minds of your audience, you just take your ordinary surroundings, you exaggerate them, and you make them exciting. All right, exaggerate your ordinary surroundings to make them exciting. Exaggerate your ordinary surroundings to make them exciting. Concentrate on the parts that are interesting. I'm not saying to lie. I'm saying just concentrate on the parts that are interesting and suddenly your story becomes powerful. Now, we're going to do that. We're going to use our surroundings to write. So I'm going to give you four words. And you're going to write using these four words. Now, the rules are, number one, is you have to use all four words. Your writing will actually be better if you don't use all four words in the first sentence. Okay, but the other rule, rule number two, is you have to write at least a page. I want you to write until you start coming up with stuff that isn't on here. Now, you have permission to fail. You have permission to screw up. If the first thing that pops into your head, you think, oh, that's awful, write that down anyway. Sometimes you've got to write the crap to get to the good stuff, okay? Sometimes you just got to get it out of the way. If you want to, you can always cross it out later. You don't have to show it to anybody, okay? But I want you to write the first thing that pops in your head. Just take an adventure ride. 
Follow your imagination. See where it leads you, okay? All right, so you ready? The first word. All right, I'm going to give you your four words. All right, are you ready? Here's your four words. Your first one, and just make them, uh, write them at the top of your page. And like he said, the rules are, you just write, even if it sounds terrible, write it anyway. And it's better if you don't try to put all four words in the first sentence. All right, so here's your words. Your first one, octopus. Write that down. Octopus. O-C-T-O-P-U-S. Octopus. P-U-S. All right. Socks. S-O-C-K-S. Socks. Ice cream. And let's come up with a really good adjective to throw in there. Extraordinary. Oh, oh. Extraordinary. Put those two words together. Extraordinary. All right. Now, what you're going to do is you're just going to start writing, and I want you to try to fill up that page. I don't care if it's a story, if it's a poem, if it's a bunch of sentences, whether they go together or not, doesn't matter. Remember what he said. And, and I really love this quote. And I do have an English background, but I love what he said. Sometimes you have to write the crap to get to the good stuff. Okay. Write it. Just write. Okay? Are you ready? Go. Oh, Start writing. All right, when you have finished your writing, what you're going to need to do, if you did it on paper, make sure your name is on it and hand it to me. Um, and then if you are not, uh, if you did it on the computer, you're going to need to email me that document with your notes and with your writing on it. That's all we're going to do for the writing workshop today. Um, we have a little bit to add to that tomorrow. And then uh, from there we will move on with the spoken word poetry.